Good morning and welcome to Promote Profit Publish, where we learn what it takes to really put your author, speaker, and entrepreneur platform together to serve your marketing better. I want to remind you to go over and take our Promote Profit Publish quiz. You can do that at www.promoteprofitpublishquiz.com and see if your skill set is really where you need to be successful at this. So today's guest is a favorite. She's always one of the uh, people that are, her shows are the most listened to on our podcast and downloaded. And it's because she has her uh, thumb, fingers, whatever you want to say, on the pulse of the publishing industry, the, the traditional publishing industry. Um, Randy Pizer helps people get book deals with literary agents and publishers. She edits and ghostwrite book, ghost writes books through her company, AuthorOneStop.com. Her authors have been featured in Time Magazine, Oprah Magazine, on the Wall Street Journal, and the USA Today bestseller list, in FedEx offices and stores, which I want to talk a little bit about that today, too, and Office Max nationally. Uh, also on the Hallmark Channel and Daily Mail TV and in airport bookstores. She is the creator of the Write a Book program and the author of The Power of Miracle Thinking and Crappy to Happy, which is <laughs> featured in the movie Eat, Pray, Love. Today, she's going to share with us what she just learned at the Book Expo Fair in uh, Book Expo America in New York, because she actually called me while she was there and said, oh my God, Juliet, I have to tell you what publishers are looking for this year. So welcome. Thank you, Juliet. I'm so happy to be here and just to, to share the information that I, that I understand. I'd love to start by talking a little bit about what Book Expo America is. Okay. So Book Expo America is what I call, I'm going to make little air quotes here, the feeding frenzy for the publishing industry in the United States. And what I mean by feeding frenzy is this is where people go to make all the connections and get the deals started or happening or signed. And so people are running around and it's like, it's all, it's usually in New York and it's always in late May. And everybody's running around looking for the right connection. So the agents are looking for publishers and the publishers are looking for distri distribution and, and media channels. And I mean, and the authors are looking for agents and publishers. Uh, and it's to show for the trade. So you have to be involved in the trade, to even be able to go to it. So most people are like, you know, running around. It's a deer in the headlights kind of experience for most people. For me, it's my playground. Uh, I've been doing this for 19 years now. And so, I'm able to set lots and lots of appointments in advance. Most people, you know, if you're a newbie going to this, you just don't have that opportunity. So people are just trying to make connections where I had 25 appointments in two and a half days. So, and I'm sitting with agents and publishers at this show. And, you know, we're talking about top agents, top publishers. And, and I'm pitching projects for my clients. And I'm also hearing from them getting feedback from both my clients and also telling me what they're looking for. So, you know, I'm able to really glean a lot of knowledge. And that's why I'm really here today is to share knowledge of the exact feedback I'm getting from agents and publishers. That's awesome. I'm really excited. Yeah. I was excited when you called me too, because <laughs> Um, when you send me people and we have a, a mutual client we're working with, our goal is to always build their list for their business. And now from what you're telling me, it's just more than for their business. Well, yeah, that's true. So yes, it's true in the publishing world. It's largely a numbers game. So what kind of number people always ask me, you know, what are the numbers that publishers are looking for and where do they want them to come from? So I was very surprised. Um, I had a meeting with the VP. The woman's title is VP Publisher New York, Hay House. So every you know mind, body, spirit public, uh, author who comes to me, usually most people are going to say, can you get me Hay House? So I'm going to tell you exactly what Hay House wants if you're a mind, body, spirit publisher. And this was new information. This is something I hadn't heard before because I've always heard even an agent about Nine years ago, you told me, Randy, it's all come down to publishers sitting with their calculators. And if they love your content, they're comparing one person's numbers to another. Who wins? The person with the highest numbers. So now what I heard from Hay House is that not only are they looking at 
all the numbers, meaning numbers of followers that you have in all different forms of social media. Uh, but they're also looking for not only the size of your email list, the click-through rate, the open rate. And that was completely new information to me. I had never heard, in 19 years, I had never heard a publisher say that. This is important information to know if you're a mind, body, spirit author. Yes. Not only not mind, body, spirit authors, because other publishers, if one's looking for it, others are going to be looking for it as well. Because and the reasoning that they gave behind this is that said a person can have you know followers on all forms of social media they're all controlled by algorithm the only only form of um, connection that you have with your audience that you have full control over is your email list yep then to hear not only email list but click through rate open rate this is important information for you to know mm -hmm. so can i expand on that a little bit please Okay, so for those of you who may not understand what Randy's talking about, what she's talking about is conversion. Uh, it's great if you have followers on LinkedIn, Facebook, places like that, but is there engagement? And then when it comes that what she's talking about with the social media and not having control over that, and, and Randy, you actually experienced this a couple of week, uh, years ago. I remember you talking to me about it, is you can have a big uh, business page, you can have engagement, you can have a big group, but you're always one algorithm away from losing your audience on social media. And I think several years ago, they changed the algorithm and you had a really rocking business page, didn't you? That suddenly the yes. engagement and visibility went down. So Randy actually is a perfect example to speak to, yeah. you know, losing your audience in a day. So what they're yes. talking about. What they're talking about the email list is, the email list is yours. It's on its own server, you control it. But here's the thing, your goal with social media is to get everybody off of social media and into that list. So if that algorithm change happens, you still own your audience. And that's why these email lists are so, so important, as well as the click-through rate, because you don't want people sitting there, you want them engaged there. That's what those publishers are looking for. Yes, you know, I, I was sitting with Angelina Jolie's literary agent. I was pitching a project to him. And in the middle of my verbal pitching, I'm just sitting with him. <clears throat> I saw him reach into his pocket and he pulls out his phone. <laughs> and my first thought is, hey, that's a little rude, isn't it? I'm pitching right. you. <laughs> but what he was actually doing was he was looking up my client on, um, <clears throat> excuse me, on, um, YouTube. And he said, oh no, his numbers are way too small. Mm -hmm. So agents are literally, and publishers, they will look you up online. They want to see the size of your presence online. They will look at your engagement. So for example, there's a publisher whose name is Andrews McNeil. And when I say that name, pretty much nobody, most people have no idea who that publisher is. You would recognize what they publish. Garfield, Goonsbury, Calvin and Hobbes, I mean, you know, they're a big, big publisher, not only of, of cartoon material, they're a huge publisher. And they told me that they're looking at the amount of engagement a person has on their Facebook page, their social media. They want to see that there's real interaction going, that it's just not a collection of numbers. Mm -hmm. So, you know, how do you get that engagement? You no, know, very simply ask more questions than statements. So that's that's a way to get response and, and they're they're looking at those numbers so you know Juliet people will always ask me well what do my numbers need to be so let's say a publisher every publisher has a publishing cycle so maybe some are going to publish four times a year or twice a year or once a year depending on the size of the publisher so what they're going to be doing let's say a large publisher and they're considering 50 books for a quarter that particular quarter they're going to be looking, you know, all things considered, they love the content in each of these books. Then it comes down to the numbers game. Mm -hmm. And they're going to, the only thing they care about from, think from their perspective, not from your perspective. The only thing they care about is which of these books is going to make us the most money. That's it. That's their bottom line. So I want to give you another idea about numbers. Um, some years ago, the publisher Wiley, the business publisher, came back on a book proposal that I had submitted to them. And, uh, and they said, where was the author spoken in the last year? What was the size of each audience? 
Where is the author speaking in the next six to 12 months? What is the projected size of each audience? So these numbers matter. And so the big question everyone asks me is, well, what do my numbers need to be? The only response I can really give you is they need to be higher than somebody else's numbers that they're considering. Mm -hmm. That 20,000 people, uh, you know, I have somebody whose podcast, she has like five, 500,000 views of a, a podcast. So, you know, there, there's, there's no equality <laughs> in this game. There's no set number. Mm -hmm. But that's okay. I was just going to mention one of my friends who consistently makes the USA Today bestseller list yes. uh, has to sell every time she has, she sold over 7,500 books. And to do that, she has a genius uh, platform building tool that she does with her list. She actually has about 25,000 people on her list and anybody who doesn't open within 30 days is deleted. So she has wow. a constant flow of people that are opening to be able to show those uh, publishers as well as a genius way to get those people are, that aren't. So that engagement rate looks very, very hard very, very high. Now she's a yeah. romance novelist. So I'm sure that varies from category to category, yes. but that's the kind of list that you like just the minimum. And USA Today is a pretty, not a low bar. It's a great achievement, but if you want to go New York Times, it's got to be much, much bigger than that. So, yes. so I think that people don't realize the scope of the numbers that have to uh, occur there. Yes. And, you know, it also depends on the size of the publisher as well. Mm -hmm. You know, so there are wonderful medium-sized publishers or even smaller publishers who can really do a lot for a book and really help it get out there. Their requirements may be a little bit lower than, you know, or they, or they could be lower than, let's say, one of the, you know, the major houses. Mm -hmm. That is great information. I'm so glad you shared that because I get so much yes. push pushback on lists are hard to build. They, they can be difficult to build with it when you don't have the right tools. So uh, one of the things that I do for all of my people when people are working with me is that I created a letter that I send to all of my clients, send out to everyone they know. Mm -hmm. In this letter, it's a simple letter, but it's asking for all of your friends, all of your, what we call the big mouth friends, everybody who has a large list, or, you know, even if they have small lists, um, we send out an announcement asking them if they would willing to support you in your launch. And if they're willing, would they please give you the size of the list that they can legitimately reach, they're willing to reach. And I did this for, for my own book, Crappy to Happy. Um, years ago, my book was um, Crappy to Happy. I sold it to a publisher, it went through five years of a print run, and then the rights reverted back to me, and I never did anything more with it. I'm sitting in a movie theater, the opening night of Eat, Pray, Love, and there's Julia Roberts holding up my Crappy to Happy book in a bookstore scene. It's before she goes on her big trip, you know, she pulls it out of the, the bookshelf and she buys it, you know, it's like, oh my God, I've got to get my book back into print. So one of the things to get a book back into print with a publisher is to write a book proposal. Which I had one for my original book. It's kind of like a business plan, which we're proving the sale of the book. I knew I needed higher numbers at this point mm -hmm. because I'd already sold out, you know, sold for, you know, five years. So I asked people if they'd be willing to support me in my book launch. And if they were, would they please tell me the size of their list? So I had around 2,300 people on my personal email list when I sent that out. And I sent it out to those 2,300 people. So in my mind, I'm thinking, if I can maybe get 30,000 people, you know, a reach of 30,000 people, that would be really good. The number, the number, as people came in and I wrote down their name and the size of the list, name list, name size, name size, name size, came to 1,370,000 people. Wow. <laughs> I, I was blown away. So I offer this letter to all of my clients just because it's going to help them. And so in the proposal, there's a section called about promotions. And we have to prove, prove the sale of your book from the standpoint of what you're already doing. Uh-huh not the pie in the sky of what you're going to do once a book comes out. You want to see the engagement you have now. That's why it's so critical to work with you, Juliet. Well, they must. If they want a really great book, they got to. They've just got to work with you, mm -hmm. you know, to help build that. Yeah, that's, it's good to know. So I, what I hear you saying, though, is pretty cool. So I could go out to 10 of my friends with big lists 
and the publisher would take a look at their list and the value of those as well? Well, they're not going to look at their list, but what we're just reporting is, is the size, the number. So we have a section under the promotion section, I mean, a little subheader called launch campaign partners. All of your friends and your associates, your colleagues, your peers, they're your launch campaign partners. And we write down just the name, the size of the list, and we just total it above there. So what I'm always looking to do is to tip the sale in your favor. How can I do that? We need to create as much leverage as we can. Yes, you absolutely must have your own numbers. But then on top of that, the more we can show in terms of your leverage through that list of all those people, the higher we can get the advance. Oh, that's awesome. And we like that, don't we? Yes. <laughs> so that brings up a good point, though. So publishers are still giving advances. Yes. I mean, just this past month, one of my authors, it was actually for a book we ghost wrote, my company ghost wrote, received a very nice six-figure advance. Sweet. Yeah, she had the numbers to prove it. Great. So um, one of the things that people ask me about all the time are the foreign rights. And I know you work a little bit with Jill Lublin on that. Um, how does that all work? Because the reason they come to me and ask me about it is because they get those kind of bogus, scammy emails from people saying that they, you know what I'm talking about? Um, yeah. So how does that really work? Like, how do you know what's legit and what's not with the four? I mean, I, I trust someone like, you know, Jill Lublin, who's a very dear friend of mine and colleague of both of ours. And, you know, because, because we've worked together for 20 years. And so she goes to the Frankfurt Fair, which is the largest one in the world, and the London Fair, Second, the, the three biggies in the world are Book Expo America in the United States, Frankfurt Book Fair, and the London Book Fair. So I don't do foreign rights. Jill Lublin is the person who can really expand upon that. Also, though sometimes Jill will, um, and like the one in, in um, Germany is eight giant buildings full. Mm -hmm. It is believable. You have to take a, a, like a shuttle bus to go between the buildings. It's, it's <laughs> so huge and so she will take screenshots of um they'll have like an agent list fluorescent agent list of all you know like a big screen and she'll send it to me and she'll say brandy who should i go after and so i'll do the the legwork here and i'll look up some of those agents if i don't know them and, and some i will know and i'll say okay you know after this one this one this one this one based on who she's pitching and what the genres are mm -hmm. So if a book comes out through a traditional publisher, there's a section in the contract called subsidiary rights. And under the subsidiary rights are the foreign rights. And so usually publishers and often agents as well will have sub-agents, somebody who's working for them, specifically working on foreign rights. So, you know, if you're going with an agent or a publisher, they would cover that. And obviously they would be legitimate. Bill Lublin would be legitimate. Mm -hmm. And so the thing with foreign rights, let me just say this one other thing. Okay. Is that usually the most money is made. This is usually the scenario. Usually the most money is made at the advance. Yeah. Those advances can be very, very nice with foreign publishers. Because after that, there's no way to audit the books of foreign publishers and to know if they're actually giving legitimate royalties or not. It just isn't. Mm hmm that's why it's really important to, you know, to be working with somebody who can go after, you know, who, who, who understands this world. Exactly. And, and I just want to mention with it, the reason that I, I know about working with you guys with the foreign rights is last summer, a couple of my self-published clients were able to work with Jill in the foreign rights area. So it's not just limited to the traditional. If you meet certain criteria with her, on your self-published book, she can sell that as well, is my understanding. That's actually a really good point because she represents self-published books. Because mm -hmm. once a book is with a publisher, they have a foreign rights division. And, and there's like a conflict of interest if somebody else is out there pitching a book. You know, that for, it actually happened with Bill in her own life where, because she pitches for foreign rights and she has a publisher in Dubai who wants to publish her, but her own publisher isn't pursuing it. Right. <laughs> so, it all had to be negotiated. Yeah, <laughs> no, I know how that goes. It worked out. Worked so out. one of the reasons I love having you on here is after you go to one of these shows, you know what's in and out. So what are they looking Definitely. for? Definitely. Oh, my God. <laughs> so um, 
every single year, I mean, you know, I've been doing this for so many years, I hear a buzzword on the show floor. I don't even know where it comes from. How does, does it spread through osmosis from agent to agent and publisher to publisher? I don't even know. But so, for example, like about seven or eight years ago, I remember the big buzzword on the show floor was, we're looking for female-centric business books. Okay, business books for women. And I'm hearing a female-centric business book, female-centric business book. The next year at the Book Expo, I show up with a female-centric business book that has the right numbers, and I know, yeah, this is a winner. And it turns out, no, it's not, because they found out, the publishers found out that Barnes & Noble couldn't sell. Those books weren't selling well. So then Barnes & Noble said, we don't want the female-centric business books. Mm. We want books that appeal to a wider general audience. Now the tides have shifted again, because you're seeing more and more women, you no, know, the you know, rising more to the top. There's more information, uh, you know, more discussion around gender equality and pay and just all this stuff, and you know, you know, and, and women I think are coming into their power in a much greater way too, in a in a visible way, very very media friendly and or a media environment. I don't know if it's always friendly, very visible way. <laughs> Is it ever friendly? You know, <laughs> right, right, right. So that was the buzzword some years ago. So the buzzword now, and it's interesting because I heard this last year and I heard it this year, and I want to just mention it and, ex and talk about it, expand upon it. This is the, I'm going to give you the exact wording that I'm hearing from publisher to publisher to publisher. We're talking about nonfiction. So if you're a business author, a mind, body, spirit author, a life coach, a coach of anything, or a memoir, what even memoir. So what they are looking for, <laughs> more air quotes, outcome-driven titles, mm -hmm. outcome-driven content. So um, what this means is I was sitting with, um, sitting, I was on a Zoom call with one of my clients and the acquisitions editor from McGraw-Hill, a major business publisher. And acquisitions editors are the ones who acquire manuscripts. So we're in a conversation and, you know, she, this acquisitions editor, and I've sold other books to McGraw-Hill, she's interested in this one title. So I'm sitting on the Zoom call with the editor, my client, and, and um, she said, we're looking for outcome-driven titles that take reader through from practical steps through point A through point B. So not so much big picture books, like, you know, like the broad picture of whatever, you know, your philosophy is. They actually, they want action steps that people can take. So when they pick up that book and by the time they finished reading it, if they've applied those steps, they've learned something new and they're actually applying it. Awesome. So, and what, so let's give some examples of like an outcome driven title. So for example, um, happy to happy, my book, <laughs> you're going from crappy to happy. So that's an outcome driven title. You know, a couple of years ago when I was pitching a project and, and this one publisher, acquisitions editor at, at the book expo said to me, you know, for example, she said, you know, um, acupuncture for anxiety. You know, the feature is acupuncture, the end result, well, we know it's going to, you know, it's going to clear the anxiety. Mm -hmm. So sometimes people have really nifty titles but they're not outcome driven. So the person doesn't have that, like that need, you know, because why do people buy books? If somebody walks into a store or they're looking online or wherever, and there's millions and millions of choices, who is the exact person, with the exact need is going to say, Oh, I need this book. Mm -hmm. That's your buyer. Exact person. So I tell people like, you know, what shelf Go to an actual bookstore. What shelf would your, would your book sit on? Find the exact shelf. And if you can't find the exact shelf, there's a problem. Mm -hmm. So if you can't find it, neither can a Barnes & Noble or other book buyer. Right. So that has to do with cross markets as well. So I, I had a book some years ago. I don't know if you know Peter McCarthy, CEO Space member. I, I've heard the name. As, I don't think I know him. So, so, you know, he's a naturopath and he had written the book. I sold it under the title of The Stress Stack. It took a long time to get it sold because it was about health and, and the cost of, of um, anxiety and stress on corporate America's bottom line. So health and corporate to sit on the, on the health shelf and to sit on the business shelf. Mm -hmm. So when there's that kind of conflict, it, 
it's hard to, for even the, uh, the Barnes and Noble book buyers, because that's really what the publishers are concerned about. So as soon as you have cross markets like that, it's difficult is that the book isn't niched enough. That book eventually did sell. The publishers changed the title to Adrenaline Nation, which I thought was a really, really cool title. Mm-hmm. So again, this was before outcome driven anything. But Adrenaline Nation, and I was in the San Jose um, airport at the, at the Hudson Booksellers, and there's Adrenaline Nation front and center, which I was like, yeah, that's cool. <laughs> that is very cool. Yeah. So let's yeah. talk a little bit about memoir and how, because a lot of people now are writing memoir. Okay. And that's the problem. A lot of people <laughs> are writing memoir. And yeah. what I say is like, everybody's life is important. The story is important. The, the ways you want to inspire people. I mean, I, I assume that's the reason you're writing it, either because it's either and or both. It's a cathartic experience to heal yourself. as It was for me in writing Crappy to Happy, my journey. Um, in fact, the subtitle of my book of Crappy to Happy was my original the title was From Crappy to Happy, Journey Out of the Pits and Into the Fruit of Life. So, you know, a journey out of the pits and into the fruit of life that certainly also shows outcome driven. Mm-hmm. However, when the publishers got a hold of it, the marketing department, think of it, they were thinking of the book. Listen to this because this is really important. This is like one of my secrets to tell you. You must answer the question in the reader's mind what's in it for me? Mm-hmm. So they took off my from. It became crappy to happy, small steps to big happiness now. Does that answer the question in the reader's mind, what's in it for me? Yes. So if you're writing memoir, you must answer the question in the reader's mind, what's in it for me? And put it in the title. Mm-hmm. So whenever somebody sends a memoir to me, many people do because, again, everybody's writing memoir. Right. So um, I, ask, I ask, I'm examining two questions. Is this a book about, it's all about me? Or is this, what's in it for me from the reader's perspective? It's mm-hmm. got to be this. It's got to be the what's in it for me if you want that book to sell. Right. So um, I was at a, a writer's conference where the, the CEO of the conference, my client, and, and I was invited, you know, to be at this co- conference. And there were 400 people. I would say probably 398 of them were women at this conference. 395 of them were writing their memoir and they were all abuse memoirs because abuse is so rampant. So I understand that in writing a memoir, there's huge healing that can happen. Everybody wants to help somebody else in a similar circumstance, no matter what their basis of their life or story is, where their challenges were, what they overcame. Certainly true for me in writing crappy to happy. There's got to be enough differentiation a publisher to say this one so for example i sold a book a couple of years ago it won 20 it came out in october of 2018 called slave a human trafficking survivor finds life mm. incredibly powerful story is human trafficking trending yes in the in the news now where it wasn't 10 years ago absolutely so think in terms of you're sharing your memoir what themes are current now that you can tie into? For example, I was giving a talk and this woman came up to me afterwards, it was a large audience, and she said, I'm a continuity editor for Penguin Random House. I never even heard of a continuity editor, so I had to ask her, what is that? And she said she works with books that are like in a series so that they track, the publisher will track like from one book to the next, the chronology that add up. Mm-hmm. So, like, if like if a character is age twenty in the first book, and in the next book, five years have gone by, but they're forty. You know, there's there's a disparity <laughs> there. So, she told me on Game of Thrones. This is this is interesting for all Game of Thrones fans, of which one. <laughs> but for Game of Thrones, it turned out she told me there were thirty seven continuity editors tracking one hundred and fourteen characters wow mind-blowing <laughs> so, anyway. uh, so i thought that was really really interesting um she told me what penguin random house is looking for now so here's another clue for you people again your your list size has to be high to get this kind of this kind of um deal but looking for, for me too books 
Okay. That makes sense. It's related to the Me Too movement. Is that trending? Yes. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And they also told me, this is interesting too for fiction writers, that I'm not going to acquire sci-fi for the next five years because they see it as a downward trend. Really? Sorry, sci-fi people, but um, at least that's Penguin Random House. It doesn't mean you can't get a deal with any other publisher of sci-fi, but, but I'm just telling you where Penguin Random House Really, they're, you know, they're following trends. Their, their marketing department is following everything that's happening. You can tie your memoir into something that's really big and trending. Maybe Yahoo. We're creating leverage. Yeah, that's great info. Well, Randy, thank you so much. This was great information, and hopefully it helps all you guys out there who are thinking about writing a book or you need to have someone pitch. Randy, how do they get a hold of you if they'd like to find out if their book is pitchable? Well, this is a great question because I always tell people, this is the book you want to write, the book a publisher will buy. Mm -hmm. so are, are they the same book? And so I love to um, just give people a complimentary call and I promise you this is really a no obligation call. Um, just, you know, I want to hear so what is your book or book idea? Because I can really help you position it correctly. So perhaps publishers, they don't want this, but they want this. It's like, oh, man, you can do this. Great. And so, you know, the way to reach me, easiest way is to go onto the contact page on my website. My website is www.authoronestop.com. One is spelled out O-N-E, not the number. So it's authoronestop.com. Oh, fantastic. Thank you so much for being on today. We appreciate your info. You're very welcome, Juliet.